Hi there, my name's Andrew. Uh, I'm just gonna put this little quick video, hopefully it won't be more than like 10, maybe 15 minutes together, uh, but stick in through it. Uh, hopefully it's got some interesting stuff for you. Basically it's about um, strategic developments and uh, projects happening around the world in resistance to uh, global climate disaster. Um, yeah, I'm coming at you from Nangawal country in Canberra and would like to uh, pass on to you a very important message stick, which is to be here uh, and in January 26, Invasion Day next year, um, to stand in solidarity together with First Nations people on the 50th anniversary of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy. And um, yeah, so we might be gathering here definitely uh, a few weeks before then to start uh, building everything here. And it's gonna be awesome to stand uh, together in a push for uh, decolonization and uh, sovereignty. But yeah, what I'm gonna do now is just do a present little slideshow and talk you through some information. Hope you enjoy. All right, so don't lose hope. We're all in this COVID shitstorm together. Um, we're possibly on the way out of it soon soon here in Australia. Um, everywhere in the world sort of going through the same things, but now we're seeing, I guess, they may be a bit ahead in terms of vaccine vaccinations and um, public, uh, what's it called, immunity and shit like that. So it's getting underway around the world. But let's look quickly at what we've seen. Um, so very briefly, part of the story is what happened here in Australia uh, in August in Canberra where we saw escalating actions day after day um, or with a day or two break in between of, of the same people, many people getting arrested multiple times, um, engaging in non-compliance, not, not signing police bail, staying overnight in the cop shop, ending up in front of the magistrates and basically forcing the magistrate to drop our bail conditions as well so that we could continue with our protest. Um, this, this obviously also saw escalation in tactics. People put defaced government property with paint inside the Department of Environment, outside the Department of Environment and at Parliament House itself uh, and the, the Prime Minister's place at the lodge. So emergency flares were used, all these kind of things. And ultimately seven uh, people were remanded in AMC prison. Um, this led to front page of the Canberra Times and some direct correspondence, let's say, from the MPs themselves. Of course, this hilarious article, I'm listening to her, Scott Morrison, talking about his favorite quiet um, protester, Francis, in her Pikachu outfit. Francis, uh, yeah, who's also a member of XR. Now, quickly, what impact did this have? Well, um, this is just a Google trend search for Extinction Rebellion in Australia. Uh, for the last year, maybe, or no, for this period of time. No, yeah, a year. And what you see is that March 2021, I think there was about 12 days of actions, definitely in multiple capital cities. Thousands of people overall would have participated. Um, so we got quite a bit of a, a reach. Um, but then in August, there's these two spikes, which are 31 and 39% of the reach of March. So this is a, this is a team of about of, of around 10 people prepared to be arrested and um, you know a support team of 10 or so on the ground, 20, 20 or so behind the scenes as well. So just showing that like a very small amount of people prepared to sacrifice more, disrupt more, gets a substantial chunk of the attention. And that we can see here also um, with the signups to the national mailing list. And what happened during this period of action as well is that we had in rebellion recruitment. So we had recruitment sessions that were happening uh, multiple evenings during the time of action that we were linking to directly in social media, which was just a great way to get people into the door into recruitment sessions. Um, just very briefly, the social media um, reach was really big. Um, in that time, tweet impressions up 861% to 1.32 million people who saw Extinction Rebellion tweets. And Facebook also reached 118,000 people. 
uh, and also just to acknowledge there were other things happening as well. There was a few blockade actions and some um, possibly other actions as well at that time. Okay, so to the international stuff. Germany, last generation, seven youth went on hunger strike, uh, all aged between 18 and 27. Okay, so I um, just stopped for a second there. So yeah, uh, there was these, this group of seven youth in Germany, um, aged between 18 and 27, went on hunger strike. Um, they set up tents and camped in the parliamentary district in Berlin with a demand for the leaders um, going into the election to have an honest conversation with them for two hours on live television. And it's with the second demand being a binding citizens assembly for the government after the election. So um, they got a lot, of, a lot of media attention from the very beginning. They did a tweet storm around the hunger strike to start off with, and then interviews kept coming and coming. Um, the interviews were often about, you know, the method they were taking, the hunger strike. Um, on day 10, the Greens party leader phoned. Then um, the, uh, so their demands were, yeah, come into this honest conversation with us. The leaders rejected this though in a joint statement, although they said, we will talk to you in private after the election. Um, but basically, yep, they refused that as a, as a they did, the, the youth did not give in to that. Um, so then this is after three weeks, four members were still striking. Um, and then what they were doing during this process as well is running in mobilization recruitment sessions. So each week they did a Zoom. The first week they had 25 people come. The second week they had 50 people come. The third week they did two sessions and they had 50 people come to both sessions. Um, and they were asking the attendees, are you willing to do civil disobedience until in prison? They got a dozen people signed up to that. Um, what also happened was there were some group tensions because the initial decision-making group of six people was widened. And um, so there was, the day this led to, this is what you could call some uh, horizontalist issues arose, which led to frustration and separation. Um, this is this is from what we've I've learned from speaking with the people. Um, and so on week three, after 22 days, they set a new ultimatum. Um, three days before the election, uh, at 7 p.m. in front of the parliament, they said, um, "We are going to go on thirst strike." and stop drinking water. And this demand they made specifically to the person they thought was gonna win, which was this uh, Schol Scholf Scholz guy. And after seven hours of declaring the thirst strike, they get a phone call from this, this candidate Scholz, who called and promised a public discussion on the climate emergency within the next four weeks. So you see here some international news coverage, and this is the uh, tweet um, from Olaf Scholz agreeing to meet their demand. So, you know, what we're seeing here is uh, intense courage, determination, risk taking, and ultimately uh, escalation as well. So it was just two people who were still hunger striking. One, Hennig, who was hunger striking for 27 days, and the other is a a woman who joined him after in the last seven days, they went on the first strike. And that was what led to um, the, the victory perhaps. Okay, insulate Britain. You've probably seen this, but um, basically it's it's been so far many days of a small group of people blocking motorways in the UK. Uh, the M25 of the city loop around London. Uh, they've blocked also off ramps, on ramps and motorways around airports, different motorways, and also at the Dover um, ferry terminal and the tunnel across the channel. So the, the people that were are taking part have been specifically recruited into a whatever it non-violently takes mentality and be, are prepared to be imprisoned if necessary. Um, we've seen that they've had injunctions put against them by the Home Secretary, which basically escalates the normal civil penalty of $2,000 pound fine maximum or so for what they're doing on the freeways, um, putting it up to imprisonment and much larger fines. 
but the people are prepared for that and so they've come back still uh day many many days since the, that injunction they're kind of calling the bluff of the police and the and the government and um forcing that dilemma so far 120 people participating on the streets have racked up 517 arrests in the first three weeks approximately 10 ga da game days days when they have been out on the road now um i, I asked some of the organizers there what they've had in terms of media coverage. So this is from Shell from Insulate Britain. We've been front page of the Daily Mail twice, including yesterday, front page of the Telegraph in the first week. We've been in every tabloid news publication daily, and now the left are picking up the story too and starting to appear daily. We've been invited on every major news shows many multiple times and all over the radio. You've probably seen them on many different conservative um, news programs. You can look it up on the Insulate Britain YouTube channel. And in, uh, in relation to the in impossible rebellion, the latest wave of Extinction Rebellion actions, uh, it's definitely way more news than the impossible rebellion, way, way more. Impossible rebellion didn't get any front pages and just articles almost daily in the left-wing media, tabloid media barely covered it. So, you know, we're looking at the purple cow here, something different, something new, something coming at stuff from a different angle. And just to look at your Google Trends, so this is the last 90 days in the United Kingdom comparing Insulate Britain with Extinction Rebellion. So they work beautifully in concert together. Um, but Insulate Britain has actually had more Google trending uh, web search reach. I'm not sure how accurate this is as a metric, but it seems it's, it's something we can do for free. So they've had higher reach than Extinction Rebellion, slightly higher. They're, they're in the blue. Um, if you look worldwide, it's had 83% of the reach of Extinction Rebellion over the last 90 days. Um, whereas this one is just looking in terms of the United Kingdom. And if you look over the past 12 months, it's looking like it's a considerable, uh, relatively close spike over the last year in the UK. And just to put it all in perspective, though, this is worldwide looking at Extinction Rebellion and Insulate Britain for the last five years. Um, and that October spike in 2019 is just flaws of the rest by far. Okay, moving on. Oh, but yeah, in terms of the Insulate Britain campaign, they are doing some of these important things like uh, in rebellion recruitment, in mobilization recruitment. So they're running recruitment sessions and getting newcomers to come and join and continue with the protests. Um, what else? Yeah, probably other important things as well. They've engaging with the right wing media a lot, et cetera, et cetera. And, and yeah, their demand, in case you don't know, is a very, what you would call bread and butter demand. It's to insulate the social housing in the UK, which the government has already sort of said that they're going to do eventually, but they're just forcing them to try and a commit to doing it now by making a meaningful statement and then they'll get off the freeways. Moving on to Finland, this is pretty amazing. Basically right now is a, is a rebellion taking place in Finland. They've been camping on the streets, 142 protesters were arrested and so for a country of about 4 million people, it's quite a significant proportion of people taking part a uh, 1,000 people also taking part, 142 people arrested. And you can see here, they're on the streets camping, which is just so cool. There is more, more awesome stuff happening. Canada, in this, on the 16th of October, are planning two weeks of shutting down. Uh, in Vancouver, with bridges and roads, they, some people said, if we do a bridge, we'll go two days in a row. And the aim is that after this rebellion, they go straight into actions on the Trans-Canada Highway. So far, they have three people who committed to going until they get imprisoned for that. And a young activist, about 21 or 22 years of age in the United States and Florida, who's been marching from his hometown to the capital of Florida, has been imprisoned. This is from Facebook. Our good lad, Nick Vasquez. Vasquez, mother of the earth, hero to the children of the world, is now in jail without bond for multiple acts of nonviolent civil disobedience. So we've got to put our hearts out to Nick and possibly take up the, the nonviolent sword in his honor now that he is in prison. 
And the last one I think that I want to talk about is this guy, Guillermo Fernandez. And I uh, saw him talk casually at this international meeting recently, and it was definitely shocking to hear this man who's a father of three uh, and a husband and a businessman saying that he read the IPCC report on the 9th of August and he is prepared to go on hunger strike till death. He's gonna make this ultimatum, which is basically you have maximum 200 days before I die to figure it out, to, to agree to the demands of Extinction Rebellion in Switzerland. And he said, you know, this movement needs martyrs, which is possibly something that we've all thought, but been afraid to to say or do ourselves. I'm gonna make sure you find the link to his website because it is really beautiful. He's written these incredible sort of stories into the future to, to his, about his children and about the future that they could have. And yeah, he's, um, he's got a social media to follow, but he told us that, yeah, he's sort of sorted out the finances to support his children and his wife he dies and trying to um, emotionally support them as well through his decision. So I guess after all this, the point is that a small group of people ready to escalate, disrupt and not comply can achieve a lot. And there's a lot of high risk, high reward ways that we can engage in civil disobedience at this time, no matter where we are, um, no matter, even if we have only a small amount of people nearby who can support us, we can get, go out on the streets and cause disruption day after day or do other forms of civil disobedience. Property damage might be necessary as well, but uh, I'm feeling very inspired and part of a global community when I, when I see what, and hear what is happening around the world. And just to contextualize with a couple of different things quickly now for thinking about, one is the um, Australian Security Leaders Climate Group. You may be aware of, but it's a lot of really high level former defense personnel who've been um, who've put together a report. And this is just a few different, it's, it's worth reading. I think we could base a lot of our communications around it if we wanted to. But yeah, what they're saying is it's a code red. The scientific evidence is that the world will reach 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next decade, regardless of the short-term emissions trajectory and two degrees by 2050, even if emissions are substantially reduced. Currently, global emission reduction actions will lead to around three degrees of warming and more once significant carbon cycle feedback loops, which are now becoming active, are taken into account. This is beyond adaption the human and political adaptation. The human and political impacts at three degrees would be profound and particularly in our region of the world with state failure, military conflicts and an epic and essentially unsolvable humanitarian crisis. The world cannot reasonably adapt to this level of warming. So they say we have a fateful choice an unprecedented peacetime mobilization to prevent, protect, prevent and prepare or further procrastination in, and a descent into instability and social breakdown. So I recommend you check out their report and um, think, about, think about the framing and what they're talking about there. And I just wanna draw attention to, you know, some underlying trends in Australia. One is this all time low trust in government from 2019, Professor Ian McAllister. This was after the election then. I've been studying elections for 40 years and never have I seen such poor returns for public trust and satisfaction with democratic institutions. Just 59% of Australians are satisfied with how democracy is working, down 27% points from the record high of 86% in 2007. So it's almost the record low for trust in democracy. That was in 2019. But um, things have gone up a bit since then, 
according to these very interesting global surveys, which I've been looking at. So, you know, the crisis, the COVID crisis has actually led to an increase in trust for um, uh, all levels of institutions, government, NGOs, media, and business. But what is interesting over the last year or so, but what is interesting, I find, is that there is a difference of 22 points between the informed public and the mass population. So the mass population don't trust the government as much. Um, and that what the mass population means in these surveys is, uh, or at, well, what the informed public means is it's about 17% of the total global population must meet four criteria, age 25 to 64, college educated, in top 25% of household income age per age group in each country, and they report significant engagement in public policy and business news. So the mass population is people who don't fit those things. So it's a sort of uh, food for thought in a rebellion against the government. Maybe we should be really appealing towards the mass population um, rather than the informed public or work out messaging that ties in with that. So yes, thank you very much. There'll be some links in the description for further research, for these references and yeah, come get amongst it.